When I talk to those considering dermoscopy, their biggest fear that often is holding them back from starting is the fear of missing a skin cancer. The big three skin cancers we see in primary care are here, and only two of them have the real potential to kill your patients, and squamous cell cancer is one of them. By using four simple rules, you should never miss referring a squamous cell skin cancer. I once went croc hunting in the Florida Everglades. The first signs we were getting close were lots of these cute little critters. Ah, said our guide, watch out. The fully grown parents would be lurking nearby. Growing up to 14 foot in length and weighing in at 450 kilos, crocs have killed 15 people and injured 376 in the US in the past 50 years. In the UK alone, squamous cell skin cancer attacks around 45,000 people a year, resulting in over 900 deaths. It's fortunate not every baby croc becomes a big croc. Out of a clutch of 30 eggs, only one baby croc survived to become a full-sized man-eater. Squamous cell skin cancers also have baby precursors, called actinic keratosis and Bowens, and while not dangerous in themselves, they have the ability to grow and change and become people eaters. My first rule for never missing a squamous cell cancer is to recognize when you are in croc territory. This is patients with many small baby crocs and where there have been previous sightings of crocs. Understanding their typical locations being ultraviolet light, damaged white skin. When crocs sink their teeth deep into your flesh, their plan is to drown you and eat your slowly rotting corpse. Nice. Let's look at three fully grown skin crocs. This 86 year old lady presented with this 20 millimeter hard nodule on her forehead. Note her age, skin type, and lots of solar lentigos indicating chronic ultraviolet light exposure. This is typical croc territory. There's a red, swollen looking, poorly defined edge to it and a hard central keratin mass. This has been growing over just four weeks. It's EFGS, elevated, firm, growing and scaly. I didn't use a dermoscope here. Why? Because it wasn't going to change my management. Quick referral on the two week cancer care pathway. This was shown to be a poorly differentiated squamous cell cancer. You'd refer that, right? Crocs vary in their temperament. It's the same with squamous cell cancers. Nicer ones are well differentiated, slower growing, more keratin, and that they are less likely to spread and recur. Nasty, poorly differentiated squamous cell cancers are faster growing. They have less or even no keratin and may be ulcerated and bleeding and are more likely to spread and recur for your patient. Here's another croc. This 70 millimeter red indurated lump on this 83 year old's cheek had been growing over nine months. It had an ill-defined border, was firm to touch and with a keratin plug in the center and on histology was shown to be a well differentiated squamous cell cancer. The most common differential diagnosis for an EFG Yes, other than a squamous cell cancer are these. This patient had had a previous basal cell cancer on his chest. There's sun damaged skin on the back with many seborrheic keratosis. You can see an ugly duckling standing out as being different. However, it's been slowly growing over nine months. Note the thickened, indurated red base with keratin on the top. It's EFGS positive. When removed on histology, it was classified as an actinic keratosis. For AKs, we'd normally expect a bit of a skin redness and light scale, but clearly that's not always the case. This lady had an EFGS lesion growing over two years on her right cheek. There's no pain or other symptoms. Note the hairpin vessels at the edge and a hard central keratin mass. Because it was EFGS and I didn't know what it was, I referred it to when removed, this was classified as a hyperkeratotic Bowen. Sometimes only histology can give you the diagnosis. The most common cause I find on my patients for something that is elevated, firm, growing and scaly is that of a seborrheic keratosis. Fortunately, these are usually easily identified on dermoscopy. The other common thing that I see is a viral wart. Rule two, Unless you can positively identify an EFGS lesion as benign, consider it a squamous cell cancer until proven otherwise. And that usually involves referral. Demoscopy helps you identify and avoid referral of all these other benign non-cancerous skin lesions. Let me give you an example where this rule saved me and my patient. This 76 year old gentleman had noticed a small scaly patch on his nose for six weeks. It's tricky to see as it's only five to six millimeters, but it was firm and the surface felt rough. It's an EFGS lesion. What is it? I was hoping the demoscopy would show me the signs of one of the other possible scaly lesions. Here's the demoscopy. There's no strawberry pattern or rosettes typical of an actinic keratosis. There's no knotted or coiled vessels on a pink background typical for Bowen. There's no signs either of this being a seborrheic keratosis or a wart. What is it? Because it was EFGS positive and I couldn't identify it as being benign non-cancerous skin lesion, 
I've referred him as two-week wait as a possible squamous cell cancer. The initial hospital letter said, oh, we think it's probably just a wart, but we will remove it just to be sure. Histology showed it was a squamous cell cancer. But because I followed rule two, I didn't miss this squamous cell cancer on a tricky location on the nose. What do you think of this picture? It's May 2024 and this is a pond in South Buckinghamshire in the UK. Do we have wild crocodiles in the UK? Perhaps it's escaped from a zoo or was someone's pet. But it was a fake head. Could the police ignore the reports? They needed to investigate just to be sure. This lady blamed herself for picking at a small wound over six months and making it grow. It's elevated, firm, growing and scaly. Here's the demoscopy. There's a large white structureless area with some arborizing vessels. And on removal, this wasn't a squamous cell cancer. It was a fake squamous cell cancer or a keratoacanthoma. These are considered a variant of squamous cell cancers, but crucially, they don't kill people and spread and often spontaneously heal and are really quite common. Of my referrals of EFGSs as possible squamous cell cancers, my results are it's a tie. 50-50, whether it's a cancer or a keratoacanthoma. Rule three for not missing a squamous cell cancer is that there are false crocs out there, but you treat false crocs or keratoacanthomas as the real thing until proven otherwise. This lady came with two EFGSs on her left upper arm, growing for around 10 weeks. Her main complaint was pain in the upper skin lesion. They were dry and scaly, although in the photo they have my contact gel on, so they look wet. Here's the demoscopy. Because Squamous cell cancers invade the dermis and often the nerve endings. 50% of SCCs are uncomfortable or painful. We have a problem with ears, a not uncommon location for squamous cell cancer, in that there is another condition that can look very similar called chondrodermatitis nodularis helicis. It's actually a kind of pressure sore on the ear between the head and the pillow. It's always painful, in particular when pressed. The treatment for that is to avoid pressure on the area with a pole in a pillow if necessary. If in doubt, refer it out. My fourth rule is ask about pain. It's a useful diagnostic clue for squamous cell cancer. Although on the ear, chondrodermatitis is another possibility. You need to know, and it's worth learning, the characteristics that make a squamous cell cancer high risk for your patient, i.e one that's more likely to metastasize. Which brings us to referrals. Here's my local two-week wait cancer care pathway form. You should check your local guidelines and get to know them well. I would expect them to be somewhat similar to mine. What about the dermoscopy of squamous cell cancers, I hear you say? The dermoscopic signs can be helpful, but are often not diagnostic in themselves. Let's look at a few more of my patients to help you get a feel for what you're likely to see through your dermoscope. This is the elderly lady with a six week history of this EFGS growing lesion on her cheek. The dermoscopy has a couple of important lessons for me. Colleagues who saw this picture wondered if it was an epidermoid cyst stuffed full of sebum with a punctum. I can understand that. This nodule isn't nice and round, however, as most cysts should be. It was also hard to touch rather than the softer feel of a cyst. Look at the vessels. I'll call this large one arborizing would you? The vessels of squamous cell cancers are often called polymorphic, in other words of different shapes, and there is no one diagnostic pattern. Could this be a BCC? I can't see any other BCC features, unless you call this an erosion, and the rapid growth is certainly not like a BCC. The other key feature I think here is the white background, or what is called in the trade white structureless areas. This is keratin. White can signify a complete lack of melanin within the skin, as in vitiligo, or the destruction of melanin and melanocytes in a process called regression in a melanoma. However, in those situations, situations, the skin is nice and flat and not nodular like it is here. I find these white structureless areas a good clue that something is going on within the keratinocytes and SCC is a possibility. This lady in her early 60s noticed what she called a cyst on her lower vulva two weeks before coming to see me. There were no symptoms. As I considered my options, with her permission and a chaperone present, I felt it and it actually felt quite hard rather than soft. Demoscopy was awkward to say the least, but here it is. It has a white structureless area, indicated by it being paler than the surrounding skin. The vessels are mixed, maybe serpentine, some dot, fine vessels and a strange ring pattern here. So I'd call it polymorphic. There's no scale, but it's elevated, firm and growing. And being in a moist area, I'm not surprised there's no scale. Perhaps it's rubbed off. I referred her on the cancer care pathway and on removal, this was a well differentiated squamous cell cancer. Genital squamous cell cancers are high risk. It's the first that I've ever seen in my 30 years of practice, but fortunately I didn't miss it because of my dermoscopic skills. This 76 year old gentleman came with a four week history of this slightly painful EFGS lesion on the anti-helix of his right 
right ear. Painful nodules on the ear. I often hate assessing because the conundrum is, could this be chondrodermatitis nodularis helicis? And therefore I could treat it on my own. Or do I think it's a squamous cell cancer and need urgent referral? Here, however, its location isn't on the outer helix of the ear and not in a typical location for a chondrodermatitis. Can you tell which picture is polarized and which is non-polarized dermoscopy? These are the four dots of a rosette only seen around hair follicles under polarized light, non-polarized light. They turn into white circles. This are called the strawberry pattern of actinic keratosis with a red background erythema punctuated with the white hair follicles. But look here, evenly spaced knotted vessels reminding me of the typical Bowen vessel pattern. I referred this as an EFGS on the cancer care pathway and the histology reported taught me something else. This specimen comprises of proliferative variable dysplastic actinic keratosis with areas of detached nests of atypical squamous epithelium best regarded as an early invasive squamous cell cancer. I think in this one skin lesion we have the full range of disordered or dysplastic keratinocytes, actinic keratosis, Bowens and an invasive SCC. If you'd like to learn more about treating and diagnosing squamous cell cancer and the dermoscopic sign, there is a link in the video description below to an update article 2020. It has two very good summary diagrams which I'll put up here which are worth looking at. You can learn more about the range of damage to keratinocytes within the skin from ultraviolet light through a one on actinic keratosis and this one on Bowen's disease.